Hi, um, my name is Ingrid McIntyre. I am a white person who uh, is, and I'm a white Christian. I uh, was raised in the South by um, white people and um, white white Southern Christian people. Um, I was formed by the Tennessee Conference of the United Methodist Church. Um, I went to a um, United Methodist affili affiliated undergraduate and then I went to a United Methodist approved seminary, Wesley Seminary in Washington, DC. Um, I have been shaped by this church. Um, and at the same time, I have um, recognized um, along the way that things don't feel comfortable to me with our entire community. Um, I feel like we are a community that is fractured um, for a lot of reasons. And one of those systemic reasons certainly uh, is racism. I um, remember when I was in second grade and I went to go visit my grandparents um, and my uncle lived with my grandparents and he said something in our conversation together about the colored boy on the hill and, you know, I, when he said that, I mean, I listen pretty intently usually. And so I pay attention to all the things and I didn't really know what he meant by color boy on the hill. Um, and I, and I guess I was just sort of thinking, and I remember thinking, oh, he must be talking about a kid on the hill that likes to color. Um, surely that's what he means. Um, at the time in life, I had um, I had lived in a Wesley Foundation, and I had lived in an urban congregation, and then was was um, on the way to a rural congregation with our family. And I remember getting in the car after that visit with my grandparents, and my dad said something to the effect of, "I want to say I'm sorry that your uncle made a comment about the man that lives." up the hill from them. And I want to make it very clear that that's not how we talk about people. Um, and I remember sort of asking like, oh, I thought he meant that that was a kid on the hill that was coloring. And he said, no, it's, it's not. And it was not a very kind way to talk about a man who lives up the hill from them, who is a black man. He, this is not what we say, right? We don't say the colored boy up the hill. Um, and that stuck with me for a very long time because uh, I couldn't understand why he didn't just say the black man up the hill or our friend up the hill, right? Because that wasn't part of my experience, um, particularly living uh, and experiencing a large part of my childhood at Belmont United Methodist Church, which was um, really diverse in a lot of different ways, but certainly had lots of Black friends there, right, that I thought, well, this is just how the community works. Um, unfortunately, it's not always how the community works, and even in that space, uh, you know, now I've read plenty of articles that even at Belmont, those things weren't necessarily, those relationships weren't so great all the time um, with white and Black people and other people of color. Um, so I've paid attention to that really since second grade. Um, I've paid attention to my relationships. I've tried to pay attention to my power. I've certainly um, grown a lot, I would say, especially in the last seven years. But when I see um, black and brown bodies who are killed at alarming rates compared to white bodies, um, when I know that people are hesitant to speak their truth, um, to speak about authenticity for fear of being ostracized, defunded, or um, punished. When I look around and wonder why we don't have enough Black pastors in um our churches, particularly for our historically Black congregations, but also why do we not have uh, people of color serving in 
in any congregation. Um, these are things that make me want to dig into the whys and like, how is our system broken? I would say underfunding, right, is a huge part of that. Underfunding historically black colleges and universities, um, their Wesley foundations, underfunding historically black churches um, and their staff, not providing enough support uh, for them. And also particularly with cross-racial appointments. Um, that is a hard space to be in, especially I would say ever, right? But, and now one of those things is because we're in a culture shift in our country, praise God. And, and hopefully we are shifting towards um, more like all of our wholeness, right? That to, so that we can all be seen in our true authenticity and that we can all be given um, our, a voice uh, that we were given by God. Um, I heard a sermon this weekend uh, that I really appreciated. And one of the things that the pastor was saying in their sermon is oftentimes uh, we confuse protocol with God's call. And I think that we do that sometimes. Um, I think and feel and see and know and hear, right? That we often um, put protocol above God's call. And so um, as a person of faith, um, I will just say that I am committed to growing. I'm committed to have hard conversations. I am committed to, I mean, whatever, right? Marching on the street, getting arrested, whatever it takes. I, um, these are not radical acts necessarily. Um, this is a call for justice. It is a call, is a long past due call for justice. Um, I have colleagues that have endured um, more than I could, I think probably have endured um, because of the space that they're moving from because of historically lack of funding, because of historical um, lack of representation, because of historical um, dismissiveness. And my faith tells me that our table is not complete until we are all present there. Um, and I do mean, and I do mean all. Uh, and so my prayer and my hope for us is that we can identify some of the systemic brokenness um, and that instead of being shamed by it, right? Um, that we can lift it up and transform it into um, systems of wholeness. Um, I have often heard frustrations around people having to get um, side hustles in order to be able to do their pastoral duties and to live a life. And I, I never was certain about those, what those frustrations were. Um, but now <laughs> I know them because I am a person who has to have side hustles too, to be able to afford to live in my space. Um, to be able to afford to be a pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, who um, is not guaranteed an appointment, who is not guaranteed a salary um, or health insurance, and who has to wait, right, until, until other people <laughs> have what they need. Um, and so having that experience has also been an awakening of what many people have experienced through the years, that they have not always been um, at the top of the list or first considered or even last considered, right? But oftentimes um, a side thought, and that is not okay. We have brilliant, amazing people in our church and people who we have not yet met um, because of some of our presentation, um, as a very white church that is systemically broken when it comes to anti-racism work. Um, I'm here for that work. Um, I think, I thank those of you who are also in the work and for those of you who are willing to join in to that work, to get on the on-ramp, right? 
we're not, I mean, I'm pretty non, 90 mile an hour down the highway when it comes to this work. And I realize that that is difficult and that is not everyone's calling. Um, but, but people getting on the on-ramp, right. Who are just getting into those lanes and just starting to have those conversations. Um, thank you. This is important work. This is about all of us. Um, it is not about one of us or just a group of us. It is about all of our liberation in Christ together. Um, and we all belong. <laughs>